Welcome back to Talking Baseball. We've got a unique and interesting and really fun interview for you coming up today. Let's do it. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Talking Baseball. My name is Jimmy, and sitting next to me is Jake. Producer BBD's in the corner. Trevor is not with us today. He is enjoying the Santa Barbara sun and sand for his Father's Day retreat. So just Jake and I, but we do have an interview that we recorded yesterday and we are excited about. Tell him what's it on, Jake. Tell him how you're doing. Hi, Jim. Hey. Um, we interviewed Emma Yamazaki. Nice. She was the, did you just say producer, the filmmaker? Director. The director of Koshian. And I always, honestly, you want to know, I have a friend named Joe Sheehan, and I just, my brain just leaps there instantly every time I say it. Um, Wait, but, say it again. Which one? Joe Sheehan? Koshian. Koshian. You're saying it good. You're saying it a little different yesterday. I was struggling because I was thinking about Joe Sheehan most of the time. Yeah, you were doing the E, like Koshian. Oh, don't critique my Japanese pronunciation. Um, but yeah, it was a really, really fun interview. We were a little nervous. Um, just... Uh, a, the documentary comes out on ESPN Monday night, 7 p.m., I believe, ESPN. Um, and, yeah, we, we just weren't sure how, if the conversation was going to be baseball, if it was going to be culture, if it was going to be both, or where we were going to land on it. We ended up rolling for a clean hour. We had a blast, uh, it was, and it was really good, and we covered everything. So uh, excited to bring that to you guys. Yep, not even going to tell them what Summer Koshin is because you're about to find out in this interview with Emma. So enjoy this. We, I mean, we, we did talk a lot about the Japanese stars that we know. Right. And Otani. Their heroics as high schoolers. Tanaka gets mentioned once, I think. Only once. We didn't spend too much time Matsui, on Tanaka. Ichiro, Nomo. Nomo. It's, it's pretty well. I, I came in blind to the documentary because that's how I live my life. Mm. And uh, it's one of the cooler sporting events in the world. So... I can see clearly now I've watched the doc. And here's the interview. We are joined by Emma Yamazaki, the creator of Koshian. Am I saying that right? Japan's Field of Dreams. Uh, me and John Boy Jimmy got the early screening of it. A lot of fun and kind of a dream event for a lot of sports fans, especially baseball fans, because it's got that like youth emotion to it. But I'm still talking. Emma, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, so we, we got we both watched the watched the film last night and I had previously only a couple weeks ago really learned about Summer Koshian myself. So it was perfect because I gave myself a little entry class because I just saw some old videos and then, you know, even the opening of your film, it's almost chill inducing chills because the event and the culture surrounding it and the history is amazing. So um, I, I, first question is like, when did you decide to make this film and share this with, you know, everyone? I'm, I'm, I'm hoping this reaches everyone outside of Japan and, and this culture gets shared with Americans and anyone else who loves baseball. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I grew up actually like 15 minutes away from the Koshien Stadium. That's uh, where you know, I lived during middle school and high school. So, and you know, every summer, every game is on national TV from 8 a.m. till 6 p.m., you know, so it's just uh, unavoidable and just part of a Japanese person's summer. So I always knew it and, you know, loved it. I was kind of in that Tanaka generation from the Yankees when he won Koshien twice. When yes. Um, We're Yankees the, fans, so that's perfect. We're in the Bronx right now. I don't yeah, know if we yeah, even yeah, said yeah. that, but like, yeah. Uh, and then he almost won the third time, um, you know, and had a rematch in the finals after, I think, 16 and 17 innings and then did another game and, and lost. But it was just so epic. 
Um, and then I actually went to New York for college and stayed there as a filmmaker for um, nine years before starting to create a base back in Japan again in 2017. I really wanted to make films about Japan. I realized having not done that um, for a while and not lived here. And so when I came back, um, it was the... It was, <laughs> That was a huge motorbike going by. Back. <laughs> Fine. Um, it's 7 a.m. I don't know why. There's <laughs> like a lot of people out there. Let it rip. Um, so um, when I came back, decided to come back, um, it was the 99th Koshien. So like the, the 99 years of this. And I watched it for the first time in a decade. And, you know, was just remembered, you know, that excitement that, you know, captivates the nation every summer. And, you know, also having been away from Japan for a long time, I just realized how Japanese like Koshien was and high school baseball, you know, when you see the helmets lined up and, you know, like the, the kids just being so orderly and like, you know, all for the team type of mentality. I think that's kind of what Japanese society is also known for. And as I was appreciating like the trains being on time, in this country as it's not yeah. in new york always and you know kind of people's consideration for others that japanese society has as gender i realized oh maybe like all of these kind of the most extreme parts of japanese things are packed into high school baseball and so when i learned the next year the 100th question has been going on for 100 years i thought as a filmmaker this is a great platform a great like arena to kind of um, cap capture these themes and and share it with the world is um you know it's kind of unprecedented I think because of the occasion of the 100th tournament that we were given the permissions to do as much as we did you know following these teams intimately with always the goal of getting it out to the outside world and so you know although the the versions of the film had aired in Japan until now this is really the moment where you know I'm very very excited that a lot of people in the U.S. will will get to see it now. Yeah, I think I think it's great, and the nugget that kind of blew me away, and cha and it just opened my mind a little in the beginning of the film when you uh, you guys talk about the history of sport in Japan and how before baseball, I guess there really wasn't much sport or team sport, and when baseball got uh, brought over, martial arts was the lifestyle or, or whatever, and. That's they took the respect and the thought process of martial arts to baseball is what it said in the documentary and like treating the field like a sacred ground and picking up the leaves. And that kind of blew me away because I was like, oh, my God, it, it all adds up now with the respect and the orderly and kind of the I don't know if sacred's the word, but that aspect. I mean, if you have any more on, on that aspect of how it went, you know, kind of no sports and then. They took baseball and they made it into their own culture of baseball. I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, in J Japanese, there's no word for sports. Like it's sports, like we took it from English because it didn't exist, you know, in the 1860s when Japan opened up its borders to the rest of the world for the first time in two plus centuries. And so, yeah, exactly what you said when baseball was brought over by, you know, American kind of teachers who were coming into Japan, it was actually called, you know, it was, it was declared a martial art. There's no other way to handle it. And you might know like judo or kendo, do means martial art. And so baseball, yakyu in Japanese and yakyu do, like that's what it was actually called for a while. So it was literally a martial art and it was incorporated into youth education. It was just part of, instead of it being, you know, I think in American baseball history, you know, there was these kind of like professional teams that, that started, you know, back in the day in Japan, baseball started with kids learning um, how to play as a part of their just education. And that's why there's a lot of like life lessons about, it. it's not just about the game, it's you know, what kind of person you are um, doing it. So that's a huge difference, um, I think. And, you know, I mean, going back and forth between US and Japan, I mean, both countries love baseball, but the sport itself could not be more different sometimes. You know, it's almost like um, a two different, two just different versions of the sport. And in Japan, uh, high school baseball is, you know, I would say more popular than professional baseball. I mean, professional baseball didn't start until the 1930s after Babe Ruth came over and, you know, decided, like people realized, oh, we can like make money off of this, like by what, <laughs> like, like selling yeah. tickets versus, you know, high school baseball started in 1915 when, you know, and it was, you know, much earlier than that in a much purer form. And so I think the roots of the sport are so different um, in the two countries. And I, that's also something that, you know, I, that, going back and forth between the two places is like they have so much in common, but I wanted to like, I feel like the U S would be 
you know, interested to learn about that and know vice versa here. So that was a goal I had to like share that this time. And I, it, it is so funny, some of the differences. And I, I kept picturing, you know, how some American teens would react in some of these situations. And I mean, it's, it's night and day and it's the contrast of, you know, how you're brought up and all those things. But I think uh, kind of zooming out for a second, because, you know, it, Jimmy said he jumped into the, the world and I like to come in blind to things. And I, as I said, when I was rambling earlier, this is kind of a dream sporting event for a lot of people that aren't familiar with it. And I'll try to describe it and you will end up correcting me in a minute because I'm sure I'll get it wrong. But there's and there are 4000 baseball teams, all of the high school baseball teams in Japan, a single elimination tournament. Uh, that ends up, I think they play the semifinals and the finals in the, the Koshian field. Um, and there's so many MLB names that have taken this route and have crazy stories. I'm sure we're going to talk about Dice K in a little bit. And you already mentioned Tanaka, which pulls at our heartstrings. And we a little clip of Matsui throwing the first pitch. Even that got me. Um, but and, and we were trying to decide, because there's a lot of different events that, in sports, we have to relate everything. That's just how the brain works. And there's, like, there's almost this Little League World Series angle where it's all the towns and it's so personal and it's rooted. And then you have this, like, college football angle and then you're, you're tying in baseball. And I, I, I don't know, what, what sporting events do you link it to? And just... Describe some of the emotion for the people Because like you said, I mean, you're saying it's bigger than the pro sport I think they had a million people attend, if I'm getting that number right So kind of uh, paint paint the picture for the people that aren't familiar with this event a little bit Yeah, sure, sure I mean, I, I think I always like to use the examples of like the Super Bowl and March Madness combined <laughs> If you can imagine those two yeah. things combined, that's what Koshien and high school baseball is for Japan. I would say this is almost like too big to just compare it to one thing because there's nothing really else that compares in terms of how much it becomes part of, you know, the culture during that time and how everybody is like unavoidable. Um, but, you know, actually there's 4,000 teams and there's 47 prefectures across Japan. So one or sometimes two teams from each of those prefectures in a knockout tournament make it to Koshien, gotcha. 50 to 55 teams. And then it continues to be knocked out to the finals. And um, those games at Koshien for those two weeks in August is broadcast. You no, know, all of them are live on, on the public broadcast at NHK from 8 a.m. till 6 p.m. It's just on all the time. And if you at that time, if you go to a restaurant or go to like an office where like a meeting, like all the TV screens are just, you know, you're like invaded by Koshien. So not only Koshien, which is usually a professional team's home ground, the Hanshin Tigers, they they evacuate for those yeah, couple that's of weeks. So crazy. Know, and, for baseball. and then not only is, is it full, you have to line up from early hours in the morning sometimes to even try to get in but also millions of people are watching it on TV um, across the world. And it just kind of takes over the country and it gets very personal or regional because, you know, even if you don't know the actual school from your hometown, this idea of your home prefecture school you root for and people get really into that. And I think it's just, I think for adults, I really think Koshien is a moment where they remember their youth, you know, they almost like, watch these high school baseball kids and you know it gives them motivation to work hard again you know these kind of like every summer it's like a replenishing of the soul for for japanese japanese people and you know it's almost like at the sometimes at the sacrifice of those boys it's like the whole nation is lifted up it just kind of there's nothing there's nothing like it and it's it's going to be a weird summer this year because because of covid for the first time we're not going to have it since world war ii but mm. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, it, it's so it's so insane that the professional team gets kicked out of their own stadium. Yeah. Now, yeah. as if if you're a spectator at, at Summer Koshian, like you said, the game started at eight a.m. and they go all day. Is it a single admission ticket? Like, if I line up and I go to the stadium at eight a.m., do I get to watch eight games? Do I get to sit in the in one seat, or is it like a single game ticket? Um, I so I think it's up to four games every day, and you know. They can go on extra innings. So, I mean, and okay, recently yeah, yeah. now they've put limitations on that. But, you know, there's like 18 inning games sometimes. And you yeah. just go on and go on until uh, someone loses. But I believe, I mean, the depending on the seat, you have to rotate like the, you know, so that the new schools cheer, cheer squad and people can come okay. in. But I believe there's also seats that once you're in, you can stay for a while. So, yeah, people, yeah. I mean, I know people who like, you know, they have two weeks 
of like paid vacation every summer uh, every year they say like they will just go to Koshien for and spend all the paid vacation <laughs> like that's how much like some people you know dedicate themselves to just like loving loving to watch it watch it and be there so it's like 50,000 people watch every game right it's it yeah, sells live. out yeah at least yeah i think that's the capacity yeah it's wild that's crazy. Now, in in the documentary, I mean, you mostly follow two coaches, two teams, and you have uh, kind of a pupil. Uh, we're, we're curious because, again, we're – like when you say Super Bowl and March Madness, we're wondering a little bit, like, how well are these coaches known? Like, are what what kind of popularity level are they? Or if I, if I said their name in the streets, would some people know them, would some know? And uh, why these coaches, I guess? I mean, uh, when you watch uh, – the main person you follow, he is, you know, so intense, and I, I won't, I won't give some of it away, but with his son playing baseball and all that, uh, it's, it's wild when you think about it, and that's kind of what you're showing with the culture. But did, I mean, did you build it from them, or when you were diving into Koshi and, you know, these two popped up, and you were like, that's the story, or, or how did that process work for you? Yeah, I mean, there's four thousand schools, four thousand coaches. So it's like, how do I, <laughs> how do we undertake this? It was a big challenge for the project, and also for us, we 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 had we had to have a team that went to Koshien. Actually, I mean, imagine it's fifty right. teams out of four thousand. So how do we yeah. how do we do this? And um, so our main character Mizutani, who is the coach of a school called Yokohama Hayato High School, um, we we landed with him kind of as the main character because actually as you'll see in the film like his his life you know not only like his daily life but you know for the past 30 years but if you think about you know the, the his mentors and then mentees it really covers a lot of years of what high school baseball has embodied in Japan so he has been to Koshien once through in a very competitive region you know he, he had to always play with Yokohama High School, for example, where Matsuzaka was at. So it was always the underdog. And in his almost 30 year career, he made it to Koshien once, but is was always very competitive in the region. But um and, but but also he was known to be the mentor for Shohei Otani and Yusei Kikuchi's high school baseball coach, Sasaki, who is our second coach. So when Sasaki was, you know, young in his twenties, he kind of learned under Mizutani and then went back to his home prefecture and has since, you know, gone to Koshien 10 times. So wow. he, this is a case where, you know, Mizutani's disciple really, you know, took took off, kind of went beyond his own teacher. Um, so, and you could really tell the generational difference too with Mizutani being older. So, you know, the younger Sasaki taking the, taking the good, you know, the, the good things about Mizutani, but really kind of adapting to the times and coming up with possibly more, you know, different ways to, you know, more effective ways perhaps, you know, to, to coach high school based so that contrast we wanted to to show and also like that you know it's all building on the previous generation so you know having those two scores also for us you know trying to get it to a u.s audience we just thought having an in of like featuring a school that you know yeah high major league baseball players went to um would be like kind of a, a hook for people to be interested about oh how did you know what was Shohei Otani like in high school and like how did he become who he is kind of a question so that was also a focus and then when we learned that Mizutani was giving a, a, away his own son to be coached by his disciple who also coached Otani and Yusei um we just thought there's so much drama there you know and I mean yeah. imagine all the different emotions and kind of the history of relationships to get to that point and so that's how we we went with it and actually we actually filmed two other schools too again because we we wouldn't know who oh, would wow. make it to Koshien right so we really yeah. like we couldn't make a film called Koshien and then all the teams <laughs> get eliminated which was a very likely possibility because it's, it's impossible to predict a single elimination baseball um so we had that too Jeez. so it was a crazy time going between those schools but ultimately we you know in the edit realized we could really tell this the story through the two schools and that's where we landed yeah i the the shot of i i don't want to attempt his name because i'll butcher it but the main coach mizutani, when he yeah. what, what what is it mizutani mizutani yeah when he gets to Koshian in 2009 and you show that shot of him in the dugout just kind of looking around and you can see the pride in his face early in the in the documentary I was like oh man I get that is like you know he reached the pinnacle so that that was really cool the I I, I want to for our audience just name the names of players that they know who have been and we've named a bunch Tanaka Matsui hit a home run at Koshian um 
Dice K threw like 250 pitches in one day and then pitched the next day. Um, you say Kikuchi pitched with a broken rib. Uh, Otani pitched and lost, and you have his post game interview from there, which is just so full of emotion. Is there is there always one player that takes it by storm? And how, is that how all of these players that I just named were? Were they like heroes of their time, or were they late bloomers? Or you know, yeah, have you I guys think- known these names since they were like sixteen? Yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely, like, every summer, there's just a couple of heroes are born, you know, I mean, for, you know, whether, you know, and out of those people you mentioned, for example, Tanaka and Matsuzaka were really those, like, in the moment at, like, 17, 18 years old, uh, a household name, and we still love them for that, no matter what happens in their career later. It's just, like, like every Japanese person has, like, a soft spot for them, for that 18-year-old that gave us so much inspiration that summer, you know? Um, and then there's, like, other other professional leaguers. Like, like Otani was always, a, you know, a very, like, everybody knew he was amazing, but because he actually didn't, like, perform that well, his team at Koshin, he didn't even make it to Koshin his senior year, which was a big surprise. Mm-hmm. You know, he was, he was kind of like, people knew him, but, you know, you know, kind of decided, declared to go to the, the majors um, out of high school and then end up joining Japanese baseball anyway. But that was really kind of when, when things took off for him, I would say. But then, um, yeah, there's, so there's different versions of, of heroes. Actually, Matsui, people know him not for his home run, but the fact that he was walked, intentionally walked five times um, <laughs> at Koshien, which ultimately worked, and his team lost. And that was, at the oh, time, uh, crazy, really controversial uh, in this pure sport, you know, pure form of the right. sport. Was, uh, you know, it was, it was a, a, a riot, basically. So that's kind of In one what game? Was, game? was he walked two. two games? Okay. Yeah. So, and so he um, still hit a home run and they just walked him five times. That's crazy. Yeah. He, he'd done so well in his previous years, too, that by the time it was his senior year, I mean, that was what the other team decided to yeah. do. And, you know, it, it paid off for the, the victory. But in terms of the spirit of the sport, it was just highly, highly controversial. So, yeah. And, you know, in our year, um, in the 100th tournament, there was this guy, um, Kosei Yoshida from from a very northern prefecture in Akita that had never really done very well in, in Koshien, who, you know, threw every pitch for his team from the regional through to the finals of Koshien, I think 1,500 pitches over the course of a month. And and he became, you know, really the the hero, although he he um, didn't win in the final, but was, he was like kind of the hero of that year. So there's always like a couple of people. Um, and then there's also other professional, like, you know, Ichiro, for example, in high school, he was... Um, he was a pitcher, actually, so he like threw at Koshien, but um, he's one of the kind of more rarer examples of, you know, he's most known for like not crying when he didn't make it to Koshien as senior. He was so focused on being a pro and he knew like this wasn't it for him, which um, mm. is kind of an exception. I think even the, those guys who go to the pros and know that they'll have a career, just high school baseball is usually like a very emotional thing. But, you know, looking back, I feel like people knew like he was a different one um, from that time. So each person has kind of a Darvish, you know, through a lot in high school baseball. And there's like just a lot of emotional shots of those players from that time, which I, you know, is, is I think, you know, the U.S. audience would also be kind of interested to see, but. And and now I mean Otani's the guy, and I think uh, I mean it. It's wild to think about. I mean we can't. I mean we talk baseball all day. That's what we do. And I mean Otani, uh, because of injury and uh, well, what baseball is going through right now. But he's so incredible. I mean the the man hits. He pitches. He's throwing a hundred. He's hitting Fast. home runs. No one, literally, no one has done this in baseball since Babe Ruth. Um, and do you get? And you know, I I know there's the cut scene. There's two little kids wearing Otani jerseys watching. And do you feel there's like more pressure on him? And uh, you know, this this kind of t- ties into some of the. Japan societal stuff and I'm probably the least qualified person in the world to be talking about Japan societal stuff but do you think there's uh, like extra pressure on him um because you know o- Otani he's already got this kind of cool niche he can pitch he can hit and you know I'm I'm sure he's going to carve out a nice career but he can also go down as 
you know, people say he's the most talented guy in the league right now because so he can do both. So kind of what what are the vibes over there? And I, I mean, if he becomes what he can become, um, I mean, what would that mean for for Japan? Yeah, I mean, we're we're so excited about him. I know, of course. I mean, I mean, like you said, because of his injury and, you know, except for that kind of first few months of his first season he's kind of either pitched or hit or things like this but I think we're ready for him to you know see show us what he can do in both both throwing and hitting um you know I mean in the 2018 like the beginning of when he went to the majors it was right when we were making this film and you know, you know you see a scene of like you know the our co- you know our other coach you know watching him on tv and his son asking is he gonna win rookie of the year yeah. and like, yes and and you know he he does and so you know that was a thrilling time to kind of like you know have that big big debut over there and I think you know I mean I I, I have a sense that of course like there must be pressures pressures for him but he's just has this kind of, you know, you know, also his coach telling us like he just kind of has this personality he can really, you know, it doesn't crush him, you know, he can adapt. He's just like, so yeah. um, has this like right mentality about like being focused and knowing what to do. And I think also, you know, he's been under pressure since he was 16 in high school. You know, I mean, right. he was, you know, he was, you know, he threw one, like, actually he's probably most known in his high school year for throwing 100 miles per hour as a high school kid, which is the record at the time. And, you know, um, he was just, he was a media friend, like everything that he's experienced, like a major league, you know, like a hundred reporters descending on his high school, you know, um, trying to like get a word out of him, things like this. So he's handled this th- these things for a long time and kind of like the the hopes of a nation or hopes of his, his region, as you saw, like, um, you know, it's kind of, He's been doing this for 10 years already, even though he's only in his mid 20s. So um, we're we're very we, we, like, we can't wait to, you know, see what he can do. I mean, you know, I am. And also, I think, you know, when you learn about, you know, what kind of high school coach he had and kind of like the, the years of, you know, yeah. like what it was like for him in high school, he's definitely been groomed to, you know, of course, he's an amazingly talented baseball player, but his kind of life kind of his approach to life and having goals. And, you know, he he declared all these things in high school that he was going to, like, go to the majors, is going to be the best player he could. Like, he's always had a vision and he's just working towards it. And that was just part of the coach's kind of framework of how he deals with all his students of, like, creating, well, how do you see yourself at 25, at 30, at 40? These are things that the coach, you know, does with everyone and they work towards it. So I think, I honestly think it's not a, not a like a by chance that this small high this high school in a small town in the you know where it snows in the in the winter you know has produced two major leaguers you know I mean over there yeah. in right now so I think that's like having to do with that environment and what the high school baseball coach did but um yeah we're like we can't wait I mean I think we're ready for some showtime <laughs> yeah you talk about the the districts or the prefectures uh that you know you have to win that to get into summer Koshian, but the one that where we watched uh, in the documentary, I, I believe the number was two hundred and ninety-two high schools. Um, so to go to Koshien, you mean? Or? No, like in, in that prefecture. Oh, in or, in Kanaga with the main, there was a hun- I think one hundred and ninety-four that year. One hundred and ninety-four. Yeah. So, how strict are the rules if uh, about? Um, sending players to different high schools are they like do you have to live within the region does it happen that towns try to make super teams and recruit like otani to come pitch for them or are there strict uh rules that no he lives here he has to play for this high school right no great question so no there is some of that you know especially the private schools that you know can provide a dorm and like strong baseball schools you know do like recruit from around mm-hmm. the country and then they basically move to that town for high school i mean tanaka moved to um the very north of japan you know he's he's not from there but he went there for high school and i pitched for this school and in, in hokkaido where you know way up in the north so things like that happen i mean um otani school is um and, and then also this, these schools, both both the schools we picked for our film um, kind of have this philosophy that they shouldn't do that. You know, this should really be from local kids. They, you know, um, 
like from their prefecture, from the region that can make it to the school, or like even though Otani school does have a dorm, they they only recruit, they only take from that prefecture. It's like their goal, their vision to win Koshien with the players who mm. live there. And the one exception really they've had in years is the fact that you know the coach decided to take on his his mentor's son from a different mm. prefecture. But that's like he's the he's the exception really. Um, and so that happens. So you know a lot of teams like actually for example Iwate where the prefecture where Otani's high school is there's a, a all the other teams are up in arms because that school gets all the best talent from the prefecture so there's another school that does recruit you know actually a lot of players from you know more more kind of urban areas of the country and they they live there for three years and try to compete with you know Otani school so that's kind of like they have to do that otherwise like they never get the best players because that one school is so good and everybody you know wants to go there from their their local um middle school teams so there's a lot of that and I think um there's all there's often you know of like with any sport like disparities between like the public schools what they can do and what the private schools can offer so there's some of that but um yeah kids will move across the country to you know live somewhere to play for whatever school they want to play if they want if they want to do that it, so, it adds up because there's so many schools yeah. and, and like you know 190 and only one goes is is insane i I, I have a question that's not on our list and a reminder that we're not biased Yankee fans. Is Tanaka the coolest ever? He's <laughs> a, he dominated Koshin. He's married to a pop star. Uh, the flowing hair. I mean, he's his playoff ERA is incredible. Uh, give, give us more on Tanaka because yeah. he's, he's the best. Yeah, and you know, I I'm that Tanaka generation where I was in high school when he was in high school, and again he he won he almost won Koshen three years in a row. I mean that's like winning once is like almost impossible, and then he did it his freshman year, his sophomore year, and then his senior year he threw out this epic you know tied game in the final, and then came back for a rematch to 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 lose but you know he'd really captured our hearts by then and since then you know when you see like in Japan he had a 25 and 0 season and then you know you know his how he does in the the playoffs especially and once he's gone to the Yankees I think really is he's this guy that is good under pressure I mean he's experienced it in Koshien as a you know 16 17 18 year old and it's just part of what you know he he thrives on it must be because you know and he's, his intensity and focus I think comes out of po- possibly this environment he was in high school you know like that he was already prepared for these high pressure situations and you know we love how you know emotional he gets I mean you know us in Japan because we've seen him grow up you know we've just seen every stage of his success we just like really can't get enough of him over here either this is a picture of him that I always look at <laughs> I don't know if you've seen it, but it's him just celebrating. Uh-huh. It's my favorite. It's my favorite. Yeah. It's like so, have you seen this? It's so much emotion. Yeah. It, it looks like a god on a baseball field. It's so cool. It is. I, yeah. If you were to take uh, Tanaka, Ichiro, Matsui, Otani, and put them in a fan event in Japan, what guy would have the longest line to get signatures and pictures? Good question. God, I think right now, I would. Uh, that, that means all all four of them would get. I mean, those are probably like the top four. You mm-hmm. know, very very popular people. It's hard for me to say. I I I you know since I was a child, I have been an Ichiro fan. You know, like and you know he he's been like I I often say like I am who I am thanks to him existing type of type okay. of kind of influence I've had personally. So I'm biased, but I think also now, you know, the players who are playing now, um, Otani, you know, um, Tanaka, obviously like still in, you know, like those, those guys have retired now, especially Matsui, it's been a while. So I don't know if right now, if, you know, how they would actually compare, but they're all like legends. And I do also feel like thanks to Ichiro and Matsui going over there, like they paved the path along with others, like on the pitcher side, Nomo mm-hmm. and the people who came before that they really like paved the path for the, the next ones to go. So I think like, you know, they each have tremendous respect for each other. I know like Otani has a um, kind of a relationship with Ichiro where they, he really gets advice and things like that. So I can't, I can't say okay. definitively like, a, like which one would be the, have the longest line. We always joke that Tanaka Probably looks at Aaron Judge and says, you think you're popular? Come to Japan with me. I'm a rock star. Because whenever he's there in the winter, 
the Instagrams and the the videos that come out, it's like he's just walking around like a god. It's awesome. Yeah. And yeah, now. I'm sure it's, yeah. Uh, I'm sure all of them would have a problem walking anywhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and now staying on Tanaka. No, yeah. I'm kidding. Um, do you I, want to I, do one more biased Yankee fan question? No, we'll get there. I'll loop it in casually okay. at the end. Uh, I'm actually going to dive back into <laughs> Japanese culture again because this is um, – I, there's has to be people laughing at that, but it's, I mean, that's kind of what a, this documentary is. I mean, it's Japanese culture mixed in with baseball and you know, there are a lot of legends. I mean, the dice K 250 pitches, uh, 881 in two weeks, I think was the number. Yes. I, I took my notes. Um, and you know, uh, Kikuchi, there's a great scene where or a great scene, but an emotional scene where he, he talks about it, you know, he, pitched with a broken rib and he gets he got pulled from the game and he talks about how honorable it was to get pulled um because uh, like that that just doesn't happen because kind of the best players throw their stuff so he was so hurt that the the manager did that and then I I think it's interesting uh because we we get a quote at the end where the the manager's talking about how he feels he pushed his guys too far and you know we talk about Japanese culture a little bit with the shaved heads uh and different things like that and are are we seeing like? Is there uh, any pushback by how much? The, yeah, the I mean, amount is, of pitches thrown is is there detriment to some of these guys that now that's kind of why the culture's turning or um and all the by the way all the life comparisons like just hit me in the chest like when when coach says you know maybe I threw too many balls and I didn't catch enough like I was like oh my god am I not catching enough am I throwing too much <laughs> um so yeah this is and that's how I phrase questions I don't really phrase them I just say as much information as I can and then I I let you talk so please. is there is there like a changing of the mindset with how many pitches these pitchers are throwing cuz in America it would be outraged yeah 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 no I know and I think Honestly, until maybe this film and people getting a chance to see it, I feel like if American people knew something about high school baseball, it would be the fact that like the pitches are overthrown. I feel like that one fact has kind of took off and and that's, you know, if there's one thing, that's what it's known for. And so hopefully this will be a more holistic view of kind of like what what are, what goes into it and like the culture behind it. Not to say that the the throwing overthrowing is not a problem, but I think, yes, definitely, especially in the past really few years um there's been i think various societal societal pressures to you know re-examine some of these kind of you know you can say they call them traditions or just the way things have been um there's you know even with the the pitch count i mean this is very new i think as of last year this year they've started to try implementing like some sort of restrictions it's still like up to 500 pitches in a certain amount of time. It's not like, it's not <laughs> like how the U S does it. It's still like a lot of pitches, but there's also a lot of pushback on that. Not everybody agrees. That's right. what should be done. It's not unanimous. So there's always that kind of a discussion about, you know, the balance between obviously like, you know, making sure like kids are okay, their health, their, their well being, their arms, but also, I mean, for so many of, kids who play baseball in high school that's it there's no future you know it's one thing if they have a you know, really save their arm if they like you know intend to be a professional and throw in the majors but for a lot of so many kids that's not the plan and that's really it for them they want to give it their all that's all they want to do so there's like always that you know that the different you know uh situations of the kids and I think it's increasingly important to like kind of figure out the balance of like what the individual what's best for the individual I mean you know Sasaki didn't get or didn't overthrow Otani or like really understood that the best of his career was going to happen way after his jurisdiction right. like in professional in his 20s and 30s so he he was very careful but then of course like the team's victory and like you know like the that's also that that balance I think in a way um, how how sometimes high school baseball kids and their arms are treated is like you know at the sacrifice of that mm. like the whole nation like that they, what they're giving is kind of this inspiration to a nation I know that doesn't sound necessarily rational but I think that's ultimately that's how 
how we view them. And so that's like, and you know, a lot of the kids for better or for worse, understand that role. And like, that's what they want to be too. It's not necessarily a long-term plan to always throw or things like that, but it's definitely changing. I mean, even this culture of shaved heads that is like, you know, um, until very recently, you must have, you must have a shaved head to play high school baseball. It's always been that way. And I thought it always will, but that's changing, you know, like different schools, um, I was saying why and also you know with kind of we need to get kids continue to be involved like baseball you know I mean the soccer there's basketball there's other sports just like every country you know the U.S. too I'm sure is being pulled in the popularity of different sports so I think there's been efforts to kind of make it more accessible for some kids like definitely there's changes you know around the 100th tournament and in the years since. Yeah, I, the the other thing that was cool about the culture of it and kind of sacrificing yourself for the nation and all that is there's a line, and I read this uh, as well, is like a lot of people come to watch the winner, but they also come to watch the losers cry and scoop up the dirt as the memory, which in a, in, in, you, know, you could hear that and be like, wait, what? But I think it's, you know, because it's a reminder of the, the youth and like seeing that emotion is so cool, but can you dive into that? Like that, I've, I've heard that said twice. It was in it was in your film, and I read it that you know as much as they want to see the team win, they also want to see the tears of the team losing. It sounds kind of harsh to me, but I, but I don't know. Can you explain that thought process? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I mean when you have a knockout tournament, like like oh, there's only gonna be one winner. Even if you're a runner up, like you lose, right? Yeah. Like it's like based on losing. Like the whole structure of high school baseball is done so that like everybody except one team out of four thousand loses at for at some point. And I think it's you know I I, I feel like just maybe the Japanese, like we just love the underdog. We love the, you know, there's like the beauty of losing these type of things. Of course people win, but I feel like, I think more, more like in the U S of course, my, my general impression is like, you know, of course, like winners, like we love the winners, but really there's just an affection for these teams and kids that give it their all, but didn't, you know, left everything on the field and couldn't win this time. But then they, you know, they, they scrape up the dirt of Koshian in a bag to take home to like share with their, their, their family and also like to give encouragement to the next generation that will try to win Koshien that they couldn't. So there's like a lot of beauty in that type of losing. And um, yeah, I feel like the whole structure is based upon like everybody, almost everybody losing yeah. because we love it. You know, I mean, like the, the emotions that, that come with it, like we're crying, they're crying. I think it's just like, I feel like maybe the impression about Japan, like from the outside is like, I don't know if you've seen like that many people that emotional <laughs> Japanese people like you know adults crying kids sure. crying it's like especially in high school baseball I mean high school baseball coaches I think like the number one emotional profession where they're like constantly crying on national tv and and I just also wanted to share that aspect of the culture so we're not just like these like businessmen kind of like more robotic reserved people like we, we come out like that sometimes and I think that's really shown in especially in high school baseball. Yeah, I loved it. Isn't, isn't there something with the dirt as well? Is it, uh, is it, uh, cause it's really dark. I thought it was a mixture. I thought I read it's a, like they, it's a special, no, I don't know. Maybe I read I'm that. I'm not sure. I mean, yeah, it's definitely the Koshian dirt um, is the symbol, you know, I mean, like, it's like this idea of scooping up, scooping yeah. it up and putting it in a bag as you're crying because you lost and you'll never come back. And this type of thing is, and it's all felt like, you know, photographed, you know, live broadcasted, like after the game, I feel like it's almost more shots of the, the losing team packing up than the winning team. And that's kind of where the emphasis is. So yeah, it's a very important, like symbolic aspect of high school baseball, the dirt. I have a couple weird questions. Oh, okay. Um, okay. First, so there's kind of this American stereotype, and maybe it's like Texas high school football that, like, you know, say say the town wins state, and, you know, obviously not everyone goes on to play football and, you know, be a professional and things like that. Do people, uh, like, kind of flex, like, the bag of dirt or things like that? Or do people have, like, a, a restaurant, and, you know, when you walk in, there's, like, the coaching bag, and they, like – they they kind of flex that 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 was part of their life, and like they, wearing your state championship. Yes, ring. like a car okay. dealership. Like by the way, if you want your kid to go to Koshi and get a car from here, like is 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 there any of that? I mean, there's definitely like 
yeah like if if you're you're if your local team or like someone goes to coach and there's like the banners that come out you know like this like kind of like stickers and posters everywhere i mean when you know like the whole town will like you know the, even the local grocery stores will like to stick that 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 on i think as the the, the guys coming back um, I mean, I think they try to be maybe more humble than generally how Americans right. are. I think that's just how the, <laughs> that's, <laughs> the, so that's the, the whole the, world. The yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think, um, yeah, I mean, everybody will like, you know, they don't like brag around with the, the dirt, but I think sometimes like what, what happens is like your biggest accomplishment in life becomes that you went to Koshien and that gets harder and harder. I think like whether it's after you leave baseball and you're in a professional and like everybody, you know, remembers that time when at 18 you were, you were this thing. And I think sometimes that actually, you know, is a burden for people too, because you can never get beyond like this experience you had at 18 or that the accomplishments that Mm. you're known for. So that's also kind of like a double edged sword sometimes, but definitely, I mean, you know, like, you know, even now, like, having made this film, like, everybody who, who, like, I, I tell people I made this film, if they played high school baseball, I mean, even if they didn't go to Kostian, they just, like, immediately tell me it's, like, just such a part of who they are, yeah. that, I mean, I think not just having gone to Kostian, but the idea that you do this for three years, do nothing else, you know, play all day, all year, you know, is kind of ingrained in who you are, and uh, even after you leave, you know, actually playing baseball. Yeah. I think one of the opening quotes by Kikuchi or Otani was like, even hearing the words Koshian like means a lot to me. He said like, it, like you know, just like goes yeah. through his host. It's crazy. I have two questions, Jake. Oh, wow. Okay. Fine. Yeah. I have uh, a normal question. Then I'm going to attach a Yankees bias question on top of it. When players uh, leave Japan to go to uh, the MLB to go to America, is the Japanese fan base – how much percentage is it very happy for them and celebratory because they're going to MLB versus kind of disappointed that they're not, you know, playing in their home country and their their time zone and their teams? Like, is there, a, a, is there any resentment? Like, I wish we could keep these guys here or are they just happy that they move to the MLB? I think there's... Always a little resentment. I think it's also changed. That ratio has changed over the years. I mean, when Nomo went, like the whole country was very, very upset until he did well, and then we loved him. But like that was in the you know mid nineteen nineties, and then now, I think at this point, I'm um, I, you know, there might be the kind of the older generation, the more conservative generation that really doesn't like that. You know, like that. You know, they they just go there and they want to be they want to stay in Japan. But otherwise, I think general fans can't wait to see see Otani play in the majors or see Tanaka play in the majors. I mean, at that point, like, we just want them to go over there as, like, young as possible almost because, you know, what's happened also is that due to different systems, like, um, you know, a lot of these great players have had to go up, like, right after their peak or right. things like this. Yeah. At this point, it's like, if you're going to go, like, please go, you know, soon so that you can really, hmm. you know, do well over there. I think that's the mentality has shifted. But I think there's always, you know, that pull of, like, oh, stay here and of not being able to, to, to see them. But I think, like, I mean, compared to what Nomo went through, I mean, now, you know, there's always, even, like, you know, Matsui, like, when he decided to go because, you know, he was very, like, almost, like, I think he, like, apologized to you know at the press conference for making that decision to his Japanese fans and things like that but there's a lot of like it's not like there's a like considerations and like sensitivity that they always have when they leave but I think at this point um we, we want to see how they do and then later on in their years they can come back and <laughs> and know we embrace them as they like try to end their career sometimes over here as well yeah and it's part two of the question is Yankee Homer question yeah when Otani is announced that he's going oh, wow. to the Angels. Is there like a collective grunt in Japan? Like, ugh, we wanted <laughs> the Yankees. I, I mean, I remember there was like, like an epic complaints from yeah. the U.S., like New Yorkers. And like, <laughs> yeah. I remember like these from headlines. Us. Like, from us. You're talking we, to them. Yes. We wanted them. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I don't I don't know. I mean, definitely the, the Angels were not like, very well known as a team, I would say, over here before Otani went, you know, like it's not like the Yankees or the Mariners where like, you know, so many players had gone. So I'm not, I feel like the grunt really came from the U.S. side. I think for here we were, we were not as critical. Like we, and it's almost like very, we have great respect for the fact that, you know, I mean, as you know, like he's, he, he's, con- he's, he didn't go for the money. He didn't go for like the most popular sport. He really, it looks like he picked 
what he thought would be the best team for him at that moment as that young player he went as, you know, instead of like being kind of like, blind, you know, in a way maybe blinded by like the best teams offering him like mm-hmm. much more money or, you know, things like that. So I think actually here there's like tremendous respect for that and maybe also a feeling that, you know, how it's turning out. Like we, I think a lot of people want him to continue to both throw and pitch and maybe like you know in different other teams like the Yankees like if he didn't do well just even for a short time there'd be like pressure to like you know not you know make him quit one one or the other things like that so maybe I feel like at the time we felt like oh like if that's how he feels and there's like the 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 team over there wants him to do both like we we want that as well so I feel like the the disgruntles came from (laughs) New York I remember that outrage um, of being in the New York side but that's fair well he'd, he'd still be welcome um and the final question: How cool is Tanaka? No, um, I was I'm a little a little mini spoiler. So if it, go and go and watch, it comes out Monday night. Monday night, seven p.m. Monday night, yes. seven p.m. ESPN. Uh, go check it out. Uh, little spoiler. So go and watch, and maybe don't listen to this part, or you don't know what it means. But did you know, or did you think? That- You said that. Okay, we'll cut it out. <laughs> we we will literally we'll cut it. Yeah, I mean it's so there's you know in the main team we follow there's 120 kids right and a team there's 20 kids that make it and of course the 120 are comprised of you know freshmen sophomores and seniors the three years so there's generally more seniors but even seniors there's like 49 seniors that year we filmed so you know imagine most kids don't ever play a official game. You know, you dedicate yourself to being on the team, morning practice, afternoon practice, but you never make the team. And of course, the final chance for that is the summer Koshien, like regional tournament, where it's like the A team is picked and then that team goes to, you know, continues on to, you know, end the season. And then once that team loses, that's it for everybody. And so it's like so emotional and, you know, you know, we, we followed so many kids, of course, in, in the film, we feature two, but we were filming with so many of the kids again, because we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know, you know, you know, we didn't necessarily want to follow a kid that like barely made it or barely didn't make it. We just like kind of went with the best stories, you know, but all of that was so emotional and clearly, clearly very, very hard for the coaches like year after year to have to kind of break the hearts of so many kids who, who know, you know, have to give up actually being the player and dedicating themselves to like tossing the ball for practice or, you know, cleaning up the field, like these kind of um, roles. So, um, I mean, we were like, it was a very emotional journey for for us. I actually didn't, um, I I knew the day of the didn't know until that day like so you know I knew I had a few hours heads up so we could plan the filming but otherwise like I didn't know what was going to happen either so okay well I'm sorry yeah. for the spoiler but I I <laughs> had to know because I was on it's a edge. personal question I was on edge yeah I know we'll, we'll cut uh, it out we'll figure that out after um I and now I I mean my last thing is I'd like to come back to you I'd, I'd say a kind of what's next um I know you mentioned Nomo a few times and he he clearly had a a big role over there, and you have a Ichiro series that I believe was on Yahoo. I might, I might have misread that. Um, and this is more so a me thing. Are you still dancing? I went to your website, and it said you had a passion for dance. I, this is genuine. I have a passion for dance. I was in a ballet in college. Not a flex. It's just whatever. Um, so, are you still dancing? And what's next for you? Oh wow! Yeah, no, I. I don't dance anymore. I really feel like my my passion for dance and the storytelling that I was into as a dancer has really just been transferred over to making films, like telling stories through films. That's kind of been the way probably for around 10 years now. So although I recently, you know, for Japanese TV, I made a dance documentary about the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. So dance and dance subjects um, are often you know, interested to me, but I don't dance personally. Um, dance subjects, yes, like, yes I um, see you looking at me. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, last last year, um, kind of around the time of Ichiro's retirement, for again for a Japanese outlet, I kind of did this series of um, like kind of you know just like I I've been severely shaped as a person thanks to like growing up at this era where Ichiro was 
in the majors and and I kind of went around the country both in Japan and also some parts of the US to also capture other people other like fans or really it's like goes beyond just being a crazy fan like really had a defining impact on their lives I made a series about that which is actually but it's all in Japanese but you know it's it's it, it was done um and then yeah I mean right now I mean of course my my original plans for the the future have kind of been sure. uh, uprooted because of the current pandemic. Um, I oft, I usually frequently go back and forth between New York and Tokyo to to kind of work on various projects. But I'm in Japan for a while. I mean, which is fine. And so um, I have a few projects. I'm I'm still I think interested in. Um, you know, similar to this high school baseball film, I have really interest in like education and how like young people are being shaped for the future. I have this kind of idea, like look, take a look at the the ten year olds in every in any country or any place, and you can kind of imagine maybe what the future of that country will be like. So I have this kind of public school project that you know I want to film at a, a, a Japanese public school for for a long time and kind of observe how you know like they're kind of shaped as a Japanese kind of so similar themes maybe almost to the baseball film but with no baseball okay. so of course like I love baseball and I have various interests in that arena too but I think also related to like sh sharing with the world different ways like what Japan is about in kind of more complicated and nuanced ways so it's not just about like sushi or anime you know I think there's enough of that so just kind of like different um ways to kind of share with the outside world I think that's maybe what I can offer more than others just because of I'm insider and an outsider here and it's kind of like the way I can kind of contribute I think in in the storytelling space so that's kind of what I want to what I'm up to awesome yeah yeah that's, I mean that sounds great it's exactly what you did here everyone sees the major league players that come from uh Japan and we love them and cheer for them and we, I had no idea that the upbringing and the the baseball culture that they were, you know, developed through existed so much different than the U.S. So I think it's eye opening. Everyone that enjoys baseball should watch it and, and see that like your favorite sport can exist in such a different way. Yeah, I think it's really fascinating and cool. So thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate that, and thank you for making the film. Thank you. Mon Monday thank you so at seven. Much. Monday, 7 p.m. East Coast. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And there you have it. Tanaka's the best, and we didn't talk about him enough. Yes. IMO. Confirmed. Almost a three-time winner of Koshin. If we ever, like, meet Tanaka. Oh, my God. First question. That's my... I've said many times on all the different podcasts, I find my... One connecting dot with a person, and I try to hammer that home. Normally, it's like your college mascot or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when we run into the Japanese ball players, Koshin's the first thing out of my mouth. You just did it like Joe Sheehan that time. Yep. Yes. So go watch the documentary. It's awesome. There's a lot of subtitles. Which took Jake and I. Yes. Okay. No, I think that's fair. If if you're watch, just be ready for that. Like, be we, ready. We weren't ready. We we thought like we were going to be able to multitask and like, okay, I'm going to do a little work, maybe eat dinner, text a little bit, and watch the doc. Like, no, you have to sit down and watch the documentary because subtitles. But it's worth it. Yeah, it's worth it. And I think I I my Japanese got better after doing it. No BBD. No, we watched it while like baseball was announced. They're back officially, so that that made watching it kind of hard. Oh, yeah, there were some distractions. That day was a it was tough a, It was a big day. Yeah. It was a big day. But anyway. Zach's good. Go yeah. watch it. it I, like I said uh, in the interview that you just listened to, I had no idea about the culture of Japanese no. baseball, and it's so different. They didn't preface the bleeps or anything at all, so I'll just let the people deal with that. Yeah. yeah. Jake did a spoiler. I tried to spoil it for you. Yeah. All right. See you guys. Have a great weekend. Go the ball. Baseball's coming back, and we are excited. So, three weekends left without baseball? Four? Four? Four. Four weekends without baseball? Four or five. Cool. Check socks. <laughs>